Welcome back to the second part of the ECG tutorial. So we'll be continuing from where we left off last time. And if you haven't watched part one, go ahead and watch part one first. And so now we're up to the QRS complex. So we'll start with what the Q wave is. So the QRS complex, we're gonna break it down to each part. So the Q is the first negative wave preceding the QRS complex. And it represents the depolarization of the septum. So when, after the AV node, so electrical signals, as we discussed, starts from the SA node, then goes to your AV node, and travels down the bundle of his and breaks down into your two bundle branches. Here, in, right as it passes through the bundle of his, it depolarizes the septum of the heart, the stuff in between. And it depolarizes from left to right as the vectors are shown below. As this is perpendicular to the leads we're looking at, so this is lead two that we're generally looking at whenever we're showing one waveform, it's going to be a negative deflection first as it's moving away from the monitor. If it was moving towards it, it would have a little bit of positive, but now it's already moving away. So it's giving a negative deflection. So usually this Q wave should only be less than two millimeters. And if it's more than one millimeter wide or more than two millimeters deep, or they say around more than a quarter of your QRS depth. And if it's present in V1 to three, it's known as pathological. And it indicates a current or a prior myocardial infarction or ischemia. Now we'll talk about the QRS complex. So this is the electrical stimulus passing from the AV node, as we talked about, into our bundle branches, into our Purkinje fibers. And this all together represents our ventricular contraction. Normally, this is under three small squares. All right, so how does it usually look like? So our QRS complex, as we can see, is usually quite narrow. So you can have a narrow complex, or sometimes you can have a broad complex, so it looks much wider than usual. What do they indicate? When it's narrow, you know that it's the wave is coming from the supraventricular region, which is above the ventricle. So it's happening in the atria. The signal is originating above the ventricles. So it's going through this pathway and depolarizing the ventricles in an appropriate fashion. A broad complex signifies that it's either there is an it's originating from the ventricles itself or that there is some sort of abnormality in the conduction from the supraventricular complex. So let's start from the first one. If it's narrow complex, I know it's coming from above the ventricles and there's a number of number of places where it can come from. So our standard one is our AV node, or no, sorry, an SA node. So our SA node would conduct the atrias, have give off a normal P wave, and then go to our AV node, go down and depolarize our ventricles appropriately, giving us a narrow complex. Sometimes the signals can originate from the atria, not necessarily the sine or atrial node. It can originate from any parts of the atria. So this could be atrial flutter or atrial fibrillation, where the origination of these atrial um, signals come from somewhere else apart from the sinoatrial node. So of course, it's going to give off an abnormal P wave, because to have a normal P wave, it needs to start from an SA node. But it doesn't matter about the abnormal P wave, it still conducts the AV node and depolarizes them ventricles appropriately giving us a narrow complex now if we have if it originates from the av node or the junction it can give us a no p wave or an abnormal p wave with a decreased pr interval and an example of this is our wolf parkinson white syndrome that we talked about previously where it depolarizes the membrane before, and it can actually give us a retrograde P wave. But we'll talk more about these in future sessions. We go into particular arrhythmias and issues. All right, so now we've understand that narrow complex 
means that it's originating above the ventricles. When it's broad complex, either it's happening from the ventricles, so there's ventricular pacing, the signals are originating from the ventricles itself, or there is an abnormality in the conduction. For example, one of them is a bundle branch block. So when there is a bundle branch block, our QRS is gonna be widened. Metabolic disorders such as hyperkalemia is another cause as well. Now voltage or amplitude. When you have high voltage, or, and it looks quite tall, it usually indicates left ventricular hypertrophy, but it can be a normal finding, especially in younger populations, especially in slim individuals. So imagine someone with very little body fat and the electrical signals or the detection, um, the monitors, um, the leads are very close to the chest and the heart is, there is minimal distance from the heart across the chest wall and to be detected. And therefore, a higher voltage is usually reported. However, to assess whether there is ventricular, left ventricular hypertrophy, we can apply the voltage criteria. And there's a number of different criteria. So the one we'll use here is this one, the circle of Lyons criteria. And we will assess it by looking at the S wave and V1 and the R wave in V5 or V6, and we'll add these two together. So the S wave and the R wave. So it depends on which one is taller, the R wave in V5 or V6, we'll choose the taller one. When we add these two together, if it's more than 35 millimeters, then it indicates that there is left ventricular hypertrophy. Similarly, we can also have low voltages, and this is defined by having amplitudes of less than five millimeters in limb leads or less than 10 millimeters in precordial leads. Low voltage could be due to a number of different reasons. So usually the signals are not reaching the detectors or the leads appropriately. This could be due to higher BMI, more body habitus allows results in great less amplitude and less signal being detected. Furthermore, other things that could be obstructing the electrical signal to be detected. For example, if patient has COPD and barrel chest with a lot of air and gas trapping within their lungs, then you're gonna have less signal detected as well. Another example is uh, peri, um, a fluid around the pericardium. So a cardiac um, tamponade with fluid around the pericardial sac. So the heart is enclosed in a sac-like structure. And when there's fluid around the heart, this can obstruct the signal from reaching the leads or the detectors and result in a low voltage. So there's a number of different causes. Now we've talked about the Q and the R, which is depolarization of the ventricles. Now what it causes, so that's the R wave, which is the depolarization or the electrical stimulus moving through the ventricles. Now let's talk about the S wave, that last little bit. So this represents the depolarization of the Purkinje fiber. So before, here's a depolarization of the ventricular wall, and you can see the vectors are pointing out this way. Our detectors are here, so it's moving towards it, so it's going to register a positive signal. Now, depolarization of the Purkinje fibers, as you can see, shows a more neg um, perpendicular kind of wave, and it gives off traveling in opposite directions and therefore gives off a small negative value. So it's representing the Purkinje fibers. Now we'll talk about the J point. So what is the J point? The J point is defined as when the QRS is terminated and it's start of the ST segment. And here it can identify a various number of J points. So J points can either be elevated or depressed. And it can be seen in a number of various causes, including of ST abnormalities. But it can also be um, noted in normal or abnormal ECGs. So it's very non-specific in such a sense. And you can see that here it's 
um, the J point seems to be elevated and the J point seems to be depressed as well. Now, here we, as an interesting little wave that's also known, he's called a J wave. And a J wave presents before a J point. A J wave can indicate whether there is possible hypothermia or even hypercalcemia, and even can be in, in the presence of various syndromes like Brugada syndrome as well. So it's something interesting to note as well. J point can also be quite confusing with ST elevation. So in here, you can see that it's combined and associated with ST abnormalities, but in here, it just seems to be the J point that's elevated. So it's important to clarify the differences, but also know that they can coexist as well. Now he comes our ST segment. It's a very important cause of myocardial ischemia and infarction. So we've talked separately about P waves, our PR interval, our QRSs, and now our J point as well. Now it's time for our ST segment, our next part of the ECG. So what are causes an ST elevation? Well, an infarction or a heart attack, coronary vasospasm, so Prince mental metal angina, pericarditis, and other less common causes as well listed below. So important causes could be, can be associated with left bundle branch blocks. It can also be associated with left ventricular hypertrophy, Brugada syndrome, and even associated with different um, tachysubos cardiomyopathy, which is a stress-induced cardiomyopathy. But our main differential is looking at myocardial infarction. So when we have an ST elevation, we have to look at whereabouts in the ECG is located and what leads it's located in. Why is that important? Because if you think about it, our ECG is describing the electrical activity at the heart and looking at various different angles. Therefore, if we note an ST elevation, which indicates myocardial ischemia in a particular set of leads, we can pinpoint the area of which it's affected. So here, we can use this, so as you can see, V4, V5, V6 are looking at different angles of the heart. And here are some extension leads um, going backwards. So past V6, we can have V7, V8, V9. And we can also go to the right-hand side as well to assess different areas of the heart. Here we can see the limb leads, AVR, AVL. We've got the uh, inferior leads like AVF as well. So here's a nice little diagram that summarizes it. So if I noted an ST elevation in, let's say, number one, AVL, V5, and V6. So let's have a look. V5, V6, it's pointing around this area, and lead one, and AVL. What side is that affected? So we can say that that is the lateral wall that's being affected by the, um, by the ischemia. Now let's look at another one, V1 and V2. V1 and V2. So as you can see, this is where the septum would usually be. And V1 and V2, he clearly is highlighted by the septal wall. Then we got 2, 3, and AVF. So let's look at 2. So V lead 2, lead 3, and AVF. So these are looking at the bottom of the heart, the inferior leads of the um of the heart once we look at the area of the heart we can correlate that with the artery that might be involved in the in the section so here in this diagram you can look at the artery and match that with the associated artery that's being involved as well so example if i found an anterior lateral looking at the leads i've noted that it's an anterior lateral um, in fact that's happening then I can assume, so you, with the anterior infarcts, it's more likely to be the left anterior descending artery that's most likely being affected. It's a very interesting way to correlate that with your findings. And of course, to really find out which artery is 
being affected, an angiogram would be the most appropriate diagnostic tool. Now let's talk about our QT segment. So Q to T segment refers to the start of the Q to the end of the T. And it's inversely proportional to heart rate. So what that means is that it shortens with faster heart rates and becomes longer with slower heart rates. Therefore, it's very variable in terms of the heart rate and we have to correct it. And we correct it to make sure it's comparable to the standard heart rate of 60. So if a patient had an ECG with 60 as a heart rate, you wouldn't have to correct it. You can calculate the QT interval and report it as such. There's a number of different formulas that you can use to also calculate it. So here QTC is the corrected QT segment. And it's, it's known as prolonged if it's more than 440 milliseconds in men or more than 460 milliseconds in women. If it's less than 350 milliseconds, it's known as shortened. What causes abnormal QTCs? Let's talk about long. So what causes long QTCs? Usually it's a lot of our metabolic derangements like a hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia, and even hypothermia. Also can be associated with heart attacks, increased intracranial pressure, certain sorts of medications, which is important to rule out in patients, and even congenital syndromes as well. Now, if there's a shortened QTC, it can be known with congenital syndromes again, hypercalcemia, and even a digoxin effect can be linked to as well. Why is this important? If it's longer QTC, it can actually increase your risk of having a diff arrhythmia, so an abnormal heart rhythm, and a classic example is Torsades D points. And a shortened QTC is in terms of congenital syndromes, it can actually increase your risk of different sorts of atrial ventricular fibrillation and even sudden cardiac deaths. So when you have maybe sudden cardiac deaths in a family that is genetic, as maybe the father has had that and maybe your grandfather's had that, it's important to screen these, um, the family for potential of these congenital syndromes. And now we'll talk about our T wave. So we've talked about QRS, which is our ventricular depolarization. So what does our T wave indicate? It indicates ventricular repolarization. And it is upright in all leads except for AVR and V1. Why is that? So it's expected to be negative in these leads because they're looking at the opposite way of the heart. So if we go backwards, so... <clears throat> If we look at going backwards to our start of the diagram, we've got lead two over here. AVR is pointing in the opposite direction of lead two. So we can expect a lot of the signals to be inverse or opposite to what we've seen in lead two. So that's an expected finding. So it's really important to know that the ECG is recording of what side you're looking at. It's different ways we're looking at the, at the heart. So when we are looking at the T wave, it's important to know that it's upright in most leads except for these ones. So don't be alarmed if it's negative in these two leads. And when it's amplitude, we expect it to be less than five millimeters in limb leads and less than 10 millimeters in precordial leads. And it's a little variation with males to females. Duration, we refer to the QT interval as we talked about previously. And abnormalities now, when we have tall peaked, so peak T waves, it refers to tall and narrow T waves, as we can see right here, tall and narrow. And it's definitely more than five millimeters. So more than five. It's more than 10 even, it's maybe 11. And this is a key sign of hyperkalemia. Hyperacute T waves refers to more broad and asymmetrical peak T waves. So as you can see right here, so it's quite more broad rather than the skinny tall appearance. And it can actually be an early stage of a STEMI or myocardial infarction. The T waves can also be inverted. 
And there's a range of conditions where it can be associated with. So those are important things to think about. Tall T waves and inverted T waves. So what is inverted T waves associated with? As we can see, a lot of different things. It actually can be a normal finding in children because of the dominance of the right ventricular forces. As we talked about before, it's expected in these two leads because that's the opposite of what we're looking at. But an important thing we should think about when it's inverted is, is it a sign of myocardial ischemia? And Wellen syndrome refers to biphasic or inverted T waves noted in some of the precordial leads that can indicate an um, left anterior descending infarction. But we'll talk more about that when we're talking covering um, myocardial ischemia as a separate session. It can also be associated with different types of bundle branch blocks, ventricular hypertrophies, pulmonary embolism. So when you have pulmonary embolism, um, so when there's a clot in the lung, in the pulmonary circulation, there's a characteristic finding that can be seen in a subset of patients. This is noted as S1, QT3, T3. So an S wave in lead one, Q wave in lead three, and a T wave in lead three as well. So it's an interesting finding. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in all precordial leads may be inverted and even raised into cranial pressure where there's a widespread inversion that's noted. And our last thing I'll talk about is our U wave. So there is usually a small deflection after the T wave. So right here, you can see there's after the T wave, there seems to be a small deflection. And this can be seen in best in V2 and V3. We don't really know why the U wave actually occurs in. We think maybe there's a delayed repolarization of the Purkinje fibers. So this is the depolarization, repolarization of the ventricles. Maybe perhaps this is a Purkinje fibers that are repolarizing, but there are various theories based on this as well. And it seems to be that the size is very inversely proportional to heart rate. So the faster the heart rate, the smaller it is, the slower the heart rate, the larger it is. Now, if, there is, if it's more than one to two millimeters, it can be a sign of bradycardia or severe hypokalemia. Bradycardia makes sense as the slower the heart, the larger it seems to be. And severe hypokalemia is an important one. If there is inverted U waves, it's very important to think about because it's highly specific for heart disease in general. And here we can see that here is our QRS complex and our T wave. And then we've got our U wave that's present on the bottom. And our U wave is present over here as well. So, and in some boxes, you can see that it's actually quite larger than around two small boxes and can be, it's considered prominent as well. So I think that concludes the end of our session for ECG interpretation. And I hope it provided with a systematic analysis. So it's very important to break down each wave. So it's very important to start with a wave, a lead that you're comfortable with. Usually it's lead two because we're very familiar with how that electrical signal flows down that heart and lead two best captures this flow. So break that down into your P waves, into each segment and analyze each segment. It's important to look in all leads because sometimes abnormalities may be only present in particular leads and then associate that with your anatomy. And that can help you figure out what sort of pathology is happening in the heart. So that concludes the session for ECG interpretation. I'm gonna host more sessions on interpreting different sorts of pathologies and we even go through reading samples as well. Please comment down below on any sorts of topics that you'd like me to cover next and I'll see you next session. Thank you.